Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Michelle Leslie. And I'm Amy Spreeman. Tonight, we want to get things started by saying a big thank you to our listeners. You have given us some great feedback on our recent uh, interview episodes with Doreen Virtue and uh, the Kozars, and we just look forward to sharing more interviews with you in the future. Uh, We also want to have a shout out and a big thank you to Emily, who uh, left us a five-star rating on iTunes. And uh, thank you, Emily. And to this comment she uh, left there, too, she said, quote, I have to say being a new Christian can be difficult, but ladies like you all, she must be from the South, Michelle, (laughs) just like you, but ladies like you all uh, present the word of God with truth and it's refreshing. I appreciate women like you all because it makes an ex-pagan realize how to be a true woman of God. Bless you both and keep spreading the true word of God. Your sister in Christ, Emily. Oh, that is so cool. Thank you so much, Emily. And uh, if if y'all enjoy A Word Fitly Spoken or have learned something from one of our episodes, we would love to hear from you too. Just leave us a positive rating and a comment wherever you listen to A Word Fitly Spoken and we will go and find that. And uh, finally, we want to send out a big thank you to uh, two of our new donors, uh, Linda, who sent us a really nice gift through PayPal, and Robbie, who just became one of our beloved patrons. Uh, Patreon accounts, uh, Robbie joins Kayla and Shannon, who also recently became Patreon supporters. Uh, We always like to send a personal email thank you note with a link to uh, that webinar that we recorded titled Discerning Women Learn to Discern. And we send that out to our supporters. And uh, Linda, we did not have your email, but I did send you a message through PayPal. So I hope you see it. Uh, We'll share that webinar with any of you who would like to help us defray the costs of podcasting. And uh, you can find our PayPal and Patreon links at our website, a word wordfitlyspoken.life and just click on the support tab. You know, Amy, you did a really good job on those y'alls. We're going to turn you into a Southerner yet. <laughs> I, You know, I normally say you guys because that's really a Northern thing to say. So anytime you want to kind of tease me a little bit, that's fine. You can just say you guys and, and we'll see what happens. Don't y'all say you guys? Like that. Oh, yeah. Well, well, Northern, that's Northern Wisconsin and Northern Minnesota. We say you guys. (laughs) Okay, I see. (laughs) Well, we do thank you so much, Emily, Linda, Robbie, Kayla, Shannon, and all of our listeners. You know, I don't know if I've remembered to tell you this before or not, Amy, but, you know, I go and speak at Christian women's events all over the country. As we're recording this, I'm leaving tomorrow morning to go speak at another one in California. Um, And no matter where I go, from Montana to Alabama, from Wyoming to Arkansas, there always seem to be a word fitly spoken fans in the audience. And they're all so kind and encouraging. And we really appreciate that. And also, so are all of our listeners who comment on social media and leave comments for us on their uh, podcast platforms and all of that. So thank you all so, so much. We really appreciate it. Yes. Well, tonight, we thought we'd try something a little different and fun. I think you're going to like it. Some of y'all might remember the ABC reality TV show from a few years ago called What Would You Do? And I'm not sure if it's still on or not, but I used to really enjoy watching it. (laughs) And the premise of the show... is that they would set up a sort of um, a weird or unexpected scenario in a public place and they would see how people reacted and then they would interview some of those people about why they reacted the way they did. For example, they might go into a restaurant and have some actors playing rude customers to an actress who's playing a waitress and see if any of the real customers at the nearby tables would intervene on behalf of the waitress. You know, things like that. It was just really a fun show. So Amy and I are going to do the podcast version of that tonight. We've (laughs) each come up with three what would you do type scenarios to ask each other about. But here's the catch. We've kept those scenarios a secret from each other. So we're both going to give our answers off the cuff. Now, if you'd like to play along, listen to the scenario, hit pause, come up with your answer, and then hit play again to see how we answered and compare (laughs) your answer with ours. You might even like to share your answer with us on our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram page. And of course, you can find the links for all of those at awordfitlyspoken.life. So I'll volunteer to be on the hot seat first. Amy, what's your first (laughs) what would you do scenario for me? 
Oh, well, first, thank you for offering to be the one to go first. <laughs> uh, I And ladies, I promise I have no idea what Michelle is going to ask. I mean, can you imagine getting grilled by Bible whiz Michelle Leslie? Oh, please. Can I just say, yeah, can I just say gulp? <laughs> and of course, she has no idea what I'm going to ask, although I'm pretty sure she is not easily stumped. Uh, the And the thought occurs to us both that we might e- ask each other the same question, which would yeah. be hilarious. Hilarious, knowing how much we tend to think alike. So if that happens, that's okay. We'll just go with it. So, <laughs> <laughs> so here's my first question, Michelle. You ready? I think so. Okay, it's a scenario. So, well, they're all scenarios. Anyway, here goes. Overnight, the government decides that there is going to be a major crackdown on free speech, especially on the internet. The mandate is no more blogs or articles or videos or social media that has anything to do with religion or politics. So you come to find out that all your work at michellelesley.com and wherever else you are is now unpublished. It's still there, but if you post or tweet or upload anything, you're going to face a huge fine and possible jail time. And that's, of course, leaving you wondering, well, what happens now to my ministry and my public witness? Okay, Michelle, so that's the that's the scenario. <laughs> what would you do? So is the question, would I continue to, to post things online? That or how would you handle your, your public witness that you've always had? Okay. Well, the first thing I would do is I would talk to my husband about it because, you know, he's, I need to submit to him. And also he always has a lot of good ideas and a lot of wisdom to share with me. And I'm very thankful for that. So the first thing I would do is talk to my husband about it and make sure that I don't do anything that he wouldn't want me to do because I don't want to endanger our family or anything like that. So that's the first thing I would do. And then, um, I probably would lean toward not publishing anything online. Um, and, and that's okay. You know, we, you and I are old enough to remember how, how things were before we had internet, you know, and everything was okay. We did ministry in our local churches and we Mm -hmm. just, you know, we did it on a much smaller scale and, um, and that was fun. And really that's the way it has always been. And the way that God meant it to be is that ministry should be done through the local church. And of course you and I both do, uh, do ministry through our local churches as well. Yes. And so what the stuff that we put online is really just like a cherry on top of an ice cream sundae. You know, we're the, we're the cherry, your church is the yeah. ice cream sundae. So, um, what I might do is look, cause you didn't say this was, was shut down. What I might look right. into is publishing, um, you know, old oh. school books. <laughs> so I might look into that or, or maybe, you know, doing that sort of in an underground way or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, let me see if there's anything else. I would probably talk to my pastor about it too, because he's, he's, um, he's pretty wise and he's, he's got some good ideas a lot of times too. So I think that's what I would do. I would probably just not be online anymore. Um, and I guess I could still go do conferences or whatever, but, uh, yeah, I get a lot of those online, so I don't know how many there would be. So <laughs> what would you do in that case? Well, it's it's interesting, and I think your blog is on WordPress. Is that right? That That's platform, right. WordPress, and my, mine are too. Um, and so, a couple years ago, uh, WordPress actually, I, I think, got caught in dipping a toe into this very thing where uh, there were some Christian blogs, and it would it uh, was caught taking down or unpublishing some some blogs. Really? And I remembered that and thought about that. And uh, of course, they were real embarrassed and denied it. But I mean, it was really clear that that's what they were doing, and the types of blogs were all about Jesus. So, um, and and this scenario really isn't out of the realm of possibilities for us, I don't think. Um, right. I've got material that goes way back to, you know, and I know you do too, and mine goes back to 2010 out there on uh, Berean Research, Berean Examiner, um, Naomi's Table, this podcast, of course, uh, a host of social media platforms, YouTube. So a lot of my material would be lost, and I have to be okay with that, uh, letting go. Uh, I do have a little experience in doing that, sort of, when I left my (laughs) radio station job uh, six years ago, and um, my old boss sadly purged about 200 research articles that I had written Mm -hmm. and published over a five-year period, and most of them I could not get back and five years worth of podcast recordings with guest interviews all of those are gone except for a couple that I managed to just happen to save but those are all gone and at the time that I found that out I was devastating 
devastated. Yeah. Um, uh, but all of these things, you know, even our recorded ministry work for this podcast, uh, the, this is nothing but a mist that um, evaporates uh, eventually. Yeah. It all burns. And what really matters to God are not the earthly things. And I really have had to learn that over the years. But, you know, all the things that uh, God cares about are in the heavenly realms. So, you know, you think about one of the first Bible verses I ever memorized was in Matthew 6, where Jesus warns us not to store up treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up instead treasures in heaven, for that's where your treasure is, or, or for where your treasure is, um, your heart will be. What are what are those, these treasures? treasures, what eternal things, you know, are, are we thinking about here? Well, the word of God, you know, we just talked about memorization. We hide it in our hearts because it is alive and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. And and so we, we talk about those things. And the other treasures are people, other souls. So um, you know, like Mich you said, Michelle, we can evangelize to the lost, we can strengthen and encourage the regenerated. And that has to become our new ministry, I think. So I'm agreeing with you 100%. You would just do this through your local church or through conferences. Uh, maybe you could write down some things, some pamphlets and pass them out. So we might not be able to share online or in maybe even in, in books in bookstores or anything like that or recordings in the future. We have to be willing to get to the crux of ministry, I think. And that's, uh, you know, that is the image bearers that he's placed in our paths. So so right. that would be my, my more of a, as I'm reflecting, that would be more my answer. Um, but, uh, you know, this is a great exercise because we're, you know, one of us is always going to be thinking off the top of her head and the other one is, <laughs> has had a little time to think it out. So, uh, right. so now the tables will turn. What is your first <laughs> question for me? I'm braced. I'm breathing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, this is one, I'm sure you've heard this question before. So we're going to, we're going to ease you into it with sort of an easier, <laughs> easier question here. Although I don't think any of my other ones are are all okay. that hard for, <laughs> for super Amy. All right. Your okay. Now this is not about your family personally. This is just a general question. Okay. okay. Your cohabitating child and that child's partner come to visit you over on an overnight visit. Do you let them sleep in the same bed? What would you do? No. <laughs> no, See, I told you to like, answer it. Well, I, I think it's easy because uh, my husband and I have already had that conversation. Um, we, we haven't had the situation come up, but we could have. Uh, you know, when my uh, when our our oldest before they got married would would come to visit us from out of town. No, they they didn't. And uh, I'll, I'll go way back to um, growing up. And I I brought um, my boyfriend at the time, Bob, my husband now, uh, up to our cabin where my my grandfather owned the cabin. And it was hilarious, Michelle. He he was a Christian man, and he said, Bob you are sleeping in the basement. Amy is sleeping up here. If I hear so much as a creak on those steps, <laughs> I'll be at the top with my shotgun. And he was dead serious. Oh my <laughs> goodness. Like, oh. And so not funny. that anything would have happened, but oh my goodness, that was so funny. And so we laughed when, when it came our turn to have, you know, adult children. And so like, well, you know, we, we have to kind of take it that same way that, you know, we, we want to prevent our children from sinning. At least in our own home, we can do that. You know, once they're adults, you you really don't uh, get to control, but uh, but in your own home, absolutely, you use your home to glorify God in, in everything. And so, yeah, you, you don't want to, you don't want to invite in uh, sin or temptation to sin either. So, yeah, right. th that would be my answer. So that was That's off the top answer. of my head. Now, <laughs> how about you? What would you? Uh, I'm sure you've had that conversation too with your husband. We have, and I think one thing that might be helpful for our read, our listeners, I always call y'all readers, I'm so sorry, um, <laughs> is to, is this idea is to discuss this with your children when they're, you know, before this ever becomes an issue, like when they're teenagers, yeah. before they move out of the house and just say, you know, maybe in the context of someone that you know who's doing this or something like that and, and just tell them, and we've, we've done this with many different subjects with our kids if this ever comes up, here's what's going to happen. And uh, so just be prepared for it. You know, I, I, we don't have to worry about our, any of our kids doing that. Fortunately, uh, our, our, um, most of our kids are very godly and, um, and they're saved. So we don't, we don't have to 
praise God, worry about that situation. And, and a couple of them are married now. So (laughs) that's, that's good too. So yeah, I I would do the same thing. The answer would be no. And, um, they, you know, would just have to accept it or not stay with us, I guess. So sometimes I think, I think, um, a lot of times, the dilemma for for Christians, especially for Christian women, since we are so, uh, it seems to be like we're so feelings based right now yeah. in this in this season of Christianity, is that we're so concerned about hurting their feelings or uh, hurting our relationship with them and not being able to have uh, whatever kind of gospel influence on them that we want to have or that we think we ought to have that we can find ourselves compromising and we need what we need to do is instead of putting the situation first and trying to fit God's word in or finagle things around the situation we need to put God's word first and be obedient to God's word and trust him to handle whatever the situation is you know if we if we put our foot down on the word and say no this is not going to happen and our kid says I'm never going to speak to you again. You know Mm. what? God can still save that kid. God can still deal with that kid. And that kid is an adult and that kid is responsible for uh, his or her own spiritual life before the Lord. And so we've got to, we've got to, in whatever circumstance, stand firm on God's word. And God would not want us encouraging or condoning or uh, making it easier for someone to commit sin. So yes. my answer would be the same as yours. So All right. See, now you See, say that you that first agree. question that first question wasn't so hard, was it? No, no. I was okay, there we go. Well, what's... Years ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were talking before the show, and uh, you know, one of, the, one of our concerns was that our we were going to overlap on our questions because we think so much alike. We were concerned yeah. that we were going to ask each other the same questions, and I went one better than that. I one of my questions for you was going to be, you know. A, Concerning all the things that are hap- have been happening in the Southern Baptist Convention over the past few years, would you leave the Southern Baptist Convention? And I forgot that you've already left the Southern Baptist <laughs> Convention. So yes. my brain was on the blink on that one. So. Yeah, and we, I couldn't remember if I had shared it on one of these podcasts or not. But for those who didn't hear that, uh, you know, I, I had posted something on social media. Uh, and, and I'm so um, thankful for a church that is discerning and, and wise. And, and really thinks about these things. So um, the church that I go to, uh, I just love it, uh, has been um, associated with the Southern Baptist Convention. And yeah, loosely, I mean, I, I don't really, you know, I don't know how far it was, but um, but there was a vote. Uh, the, the pastor said, you know, the elders and, and I have been talking about, um, you know, what's been going on with the Southern Baptist Convention, and uh, we want you to be aware. And so on this date, three weeks from now, uh, we're going to put forth a proposal uh, about what we're, you know, deciding whether to stay or leave, and, and we'll explain our reasonings then. But you can, you know, you in the meantime, um, go and take a look what's going on. And so, and I already knew kind of what was going on, but uh, the the day came and, and, you know, all members were invited to stay after for a quick uh, discussion about it. We didn't, we didn't make it about the church service. The church service is, is the, the sermon that that's about right. the word, but this was afterward. And uh, the pastor explained what the, what the concerns were, uh, CRT, uh, you know, women in the pulpit, that kind of thing, uh, things that we've talked about on this show a lot. And uh, then he, he put it to a vote after saying, you know, we, we recommend that we detach ourselves from the SBC and the, uh, and the elders are in agreement. What say you? Raise your hand. Say aye if you agree or, or nay if you don't. It was unanimous, Michelle. Everybody uh, and, and nobody had left early. All the members stayed. And uh, we all voted yes. Let's let's separate. You know, we don't know what that means right now. We're you know we kind of have to see what next steps are. But we for sure don't want to be affiliated with uh, the direction. So that that's what I would have said if you would have asked me, and I hadn't already. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have said my I. I 
well, first of all, everybody that's listening needs to understand that every church in the Southern Baptist Convention is autonomous. That right, means right. that we are not beholden to any edicts that the national, that the president or the national leadership hand down or anything like that. So every church right. kind of runs itself, decides on things for itself. And uh, I am in a Southern Baptist church that is still in the convention. And it is a, it is just, I can't say enough good things about this church. I'm so thankful for it that we finally found it. Um, and for my pastors and everything as well. And uh, we have not left yet. Um, I think my pastors are more of the mindset of, of trying to put up a good fight, you know, and fight yeah. the, the false doctrine and the bad things that are going on in the convention. And I think a lot of pastors and leaders feel that way, and they just don't want to give up without a good fight. And I certainly yes. don't blame any of them. And I support my, my pastors. And, you know, Hebrews 13 says that we are to submit to our church leaders. And it is certainly easy to easy for me to do that. Um, my personal feeling is that I was ready to leave the Southern Baptist Convention two or three years ago before I even joined the church <laughs> I'm in now. Um, you know, I, I just um, personally, just speaking for myself, um, I just, I do not see things turning around. And I, I think it's, there's, there's going to be a good fight put up, no doubt. But I just feel like in the end, it's, nothing's going to change. And we will have possibly wasted the time and the energy and the effort. Uh, and, and, you know, and there's a sense in which that's not a waste, you know, putting, putting up a good fight is not a waste, but Correct, uh, right. I just don't, I think we're going to find ourselves two, three years down the line after fighting, probably right in the same place we're at right now. Yeah. So, um, but you know what, I, I trust my pastors and they are so wonderful. And if, if this is the the biggest disagreement we have, it's not a big disagreement, you know. Uh, I'm I'm ready to to follow them, follow their leadership, and uh, and uh, trust that they are doing what is wise and godly for our church. So, a little bonus question there, but uh, are yeah. you ready to ask me your next question yet? I am okay, and it, and uh, I was a little nervous when I first heard your your first question for me because it, it sort of started out almost the same. So here, uh oh, here we go. So <laughs> okay. this, this also has to do with children. Um, let's say here's the scenario, Michelle. Your okay. high school aged son or daughter takes you aside one evening in private and says, "Mom, I'm gay and I'm in love." Ouch. Uh, this is completely out of the blue, and this child has never even given you the slightest clue that this would happen. So, um, and many Christian parents, I ask this question, Michelle, because so many Christian parents have been exactly in this spot. So, what would you do? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, the, first of all, that that has never happened to me. And that would, I don't think that would ever happen to me. Well, first of all, it could never happen to me because all of my children are finished with high school. So <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> he said true. it was a high school kid. Um, but anyway, um, I just know that's a really heartbreaking situation for uh, even some personal friends of mine that, uh, that, and some readers and followers and things like that. And I'm sure we have some listeners in our audience who also have yes. uh, situations similar to that in their own lives. Uh, I think my husband and I would need to talk and, you know, I always go back to my husband, but that's what we're supposed Excellent. to do as was. Yep. It's very important. Um, so we would need to talk about it and we would need to pray about it and decide how we're going to talk to our child, not necessarily what we're going to say, but how we're going to put it to our child. Yeah. And, um, we would first urge our child to repent we would talk to our child about everything that scripture says about homosexuality being a sin. Of course, we would not, um, you know, berate our child or anything like that, uh, but speak to him or her. I say him because we have five boys You're and one girl. You're mostly boys, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, the, and our daughter's married. So. <laughs> uh, so we would definitely have some serious talks about the sinfulness, the sinful nature of what this child is doing. And uh, certainly share the gospel with this child again in hopes that the Lord would uh, change his heart and help him to come to Christ as Savior. And, uh, and then we would, you know, if he persisted in that, um, we would have to lay down, if, if he's a high school kid, he's still living at home. So right. we would have to lay down some ground rules. There would not be any dating. 
there would not be any, um, you know, any, I don't know, any, any of the behavior or anything like that that goes along with uh, sinful sexual behavior. Uh, we would have to think about, um, I don't know that we would let any, anybody, our child referred to as a boyfriend come over to the house. That would have to be something we would have to talk about and think about. I think that can be a really situational type of thing. Yeah. So, um, you know, we certainly wouldn't be ugly to, to this boyfriend or whatever, but, um, we would have to have some rules about that at least. Um, and, uh, we would probably, if there were a way to do it, uh, get, get our child into some pastoral counseling with our pastor or possibly with a biblical counselor and, um, and see if, you know, we can, and probably we would go ourselves with, you know, our child and see if we could work through all of this as a family with someone who's a little more objective, uh, because this is a really emotionally charged issue. So, um, I think that's what we would do. And if, you know, hopefully, hopefully our child would repent, we would certainly be praying for our child to repent and to get saved. Um, but if he didn't, you know, he, as long as he lived under our roof, he was going, he would ha- be having to follow our rules. So, right. um, there would definitely be some rules about behavior and there would definitely be some rules about who could and could not come over, uh, and who he could and could not hang around with. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> what would you do? Uh, such, such a wise, uh, wise answer, Michelle. And, um, and, and I agree with everything you said, uh, this scenario, um, is, uh, really unfortunately reality for so many. It's a horrible place to be. And, you know, just upon hearing the news, I, I kind of went with more of an initial, you know, the shock of it. And my flesh yeah. would, I, my flesh would want to immediately break down in tears and react very emotionally. And so, oh yeah, um, um, there is a time to weep and scream out to God, but probably not in that initial moment. So you almost need to prepare yourself for it now if you're ever confronted with the news like this. Um, so, you know, what is the first thing you're going to say? Because your child will, uh, if this scenario ever comes true, your child will have already anticipated this conversation, uh, what you might say, and then how he or she would respond. So they've had time to think about it. Um, and I guess the wise thing to do would be to just, you know, take a deep breath and start asking questions. And, and I say that for two reasons. First, um, you're going to want to buy some time uh, to pray in your head, God, you know, I, I need your wisdom right now. Help me, <laughs> help, help me to recall all those uh, Bible verses I've hidden away because I can't even remember my own name right now. I mean, you're in panic kind of situation there. Um, but then of course you want to be, uh, you know, help me love my child the way you would. Uh, but the second reason you want to ask those questions is to listen to your child respectfully without interrupting. Um, and, and we talked a, a few few weeks ago about the tone police. This is a time when you really want to watch uh, how you speak, uh, you know, use your words wisely. Um, and without that, that f- expression that you want to have on your face, you know, you want your face to kind of be expressionless, I guess. And that's just me. But, um, you know, and, and the questions I would ask, you know, how long have you felt this way? Tell me more. Are you declaring to me right now that you are gay, that you've decided to go down this path? Uh, and, uh, you know, ask these open-ended questions so that you have time. And uh, I don't know about you, Michelle, but I have, I can actually do both things. I can pray in my head while asking and listening. So um, it's a, a phenomenal gift that I think many women have to be able to have many <laughs> tabs open at once, yes. uh, especially in that, that moment, you know, like going to a restaurant and hearing hearing all of the conversations and then understanding them all. So anyway, um, but remember this, this kid will have already practiced his responses. Um, so you want him to feel heard and misunderstood, but again, you don't want to be in any kind of compromise because you know the truth. And when it's your time to speak, you can, of course, you want to start with, I love you. Um, you can maybe say something like we've all been tempted by sexual sin, but let them know that you're going to need some time to process. Um, and it's okay to say, not I'm ashamed, but sweetheart, I'm genuinely 
alarmed. I'm very scared for you because I love you. And because I know as a child of God, what this means for you, because you're not just disagreeing with your family's values. If you pursue this relationship and, you know, the homosexuality path, you are actually rejecting your God. All sin and rebellion separates us from him. And so sometimes you can, you know, sometimes those words will stop him or her dead in their tracks. You, know, you can ask, did you know that? Are you willing to reject him? Um, you know, sometimes it doesn't have any effect on them at all. And then you've got to think about, you know, about their salvation. But however the conversation in that moment concludes, I, I would ask if it's okay to pray with him or her and then just say, you know, I need time to talk with your father about this. Um, but Michelle, in the age that we live in right now, more churches, unfortunately, are accepting sin and rebellion. Um, and, and this is where I wanted to play some sound because there is a brand new seminar coming out from uh, Matthew Vines. And a lot of you guys know who Matthew Vines is. Uh, he's got a Reformation project. He wrote a book a few years back called God and the Gay Christian. Um, so anyway, I, I kind of anonymously subscribe because I want to keep tabs on him because he's so dangerous. I just want to warn people about you know where it's coming. So I saw this thing in my inbox today. Uh, it's a video trailer for a new seminar that he's got. I don't want to play this clip for you now. Uh, and it's not just for people who say they are uh, homosexual, but for their families and uh, their church men, uh, members. This is to get them to become more uh, gay affirming. So I'm going to play it right now. Are you interested in learning more about the Bible and LGBTQ inclusion? Have you been wrestling with how to reconcile your love for gay, bisexual, and transgender people in your life with your love and respect for the Bible? My name is Matthew Vines. I'm the author of the book, God and the Gay Christian, and the host of the complete video course on the biblical case for LGBTQ inclusion. In this in-depth course, I explore the theological debates about sexual orientation and gender identity, from the six biblical passages that refer to same-sex behavior, to broader themes in scripture about marriage, celibacy, and the roles of men and women. If you'd like to learn more about how Christians can both affirm the authority of the Bible and affirm their LGBTQ friends and loved ones, I invite you to join me. So, uh, Michelle, you heard the you heard Matthew Vines there, and I, I play that just because that's what Christian parents are up against. Because you know the, the, those kids are going to find this, uh, you know this this will seep into many churches. It already has, and uh, and so, what are your thoughts? I mean, how do we deal with uh, these anti truths that are coming in? Well, we've we've got to combat it with scripture, and you're right that you know this has been happening for a long time. Uh, yeah. Matthew Vines has been at about his work and and uh, some of these other conferences like Revoice and things like that have been going on for a while, and so it's understandable that our children might pick up some of that false rhetoric. And so we've we've really just got to saturate the whole thing with with scripture and prayer. So um, yeah, it's it's unfortunately it's a blight on the church this whole yes. um this whole idea that we can compromise and uh and not you know not stick to scripture like we should because a lot of times we're afraid we're afraid of you know our child severing that relationship with us and so and we don't want to you know a lot of times we'll compromise on things when we shouldn't and we should really stand firmly on scripture and uh and just love, you know, love that child and love, you know, love, we always love sinners enough to share the gospel with them. And so that's, I think that's what we should, should do on that. Oh, amen. All right. I'm ready for my next question. <laughs> okay. Next question. Here we go. What if your pastor started requiring vaccine passports to come to church? Ah, well, we're actually, we're already starting to see that in some churches uh, that pastors are doing that. Churches are requiring these vaccine passports. Um, I'm I'm pretty sure mine wouldn't. I'm kind of laughing because mine, mine would be, I, if my pastor's listening right now, he's shaking his head and smiling, but um, I, that would um, inspire some hard uh, questions for our church because, you know, we have that, that freedom uh, in liberty uh, as Christians. This is not a gospel issue, the, you know, the vaccines and all of that. And, and I would just encourage our listeners to go back and listen to uh, a couple of weeks ago, we did the podcast. Uh, it was 
was a glad you asked uh, Q and A, uh, where listeners asked us everything about uh, from vaccines to COVID, uh, mask wearing, and all of that stuff. And so uh, we had we had an right. entire program <laughs> dedicated to that. And uh, you know, I'm I'm vaccinated, but that doesn't mean that uh, I am for restrictions or mandates or anything like that. And I explained why I had to be vaccinated, um, you know, because of my health issues back in that podcast. So uh, ladies, go take a listen to that. But I think, Michelle, um, you know, it's a hard thing because I would be very surprised and disappointed if my church did require uh, vaccine passports just to get in the door, you know, to, to listen to a sermon and, and be a part of the fellowship. Uh, we are to gather, the Bible says, to worship, and there there shouldn't be uh, restrictions on that at all. So right. I think, um, you know, some people might say, well, you could always join on Zoom then. Um, but <laughs> that's not really church, is it? <laughs> that's not gathering with the saints. So, um, you know, and, and if you if you wanted to, you could say, well, you know, if you wanted to wear a mask, you could. If you wanted to uh, you know, sit a little bit apart from people and use hand sanitizer. I mean, a lot of people are doing that now and that's fine. But um, but to require we'd, we'd have to seriously consider it, you know, we, we'd have to really consider if, if that's the church for us, if, if it if it goes in that direction. But thankfully, our church wouldn't do that. How about you? Yeah, no, I, I cannot imagine my pastor even having that idea enter his <laughs> head, uh, knowing him or any of my pastors, really. But uh, yeah, uh, and my husband certainly would yeah. not think that was a good thing either. Um so I think what we would have to do is we would we would have to go talk to our pastor and hopefully uh, be able to show him that this is not the thing to do, that this is not something that scripture that God would want us to do um, and and talk to him about it and hopefully talk him out of it. But um, if he did not change his mind, I think we would be looking for a new church. Um, and also if he did, if maybe even if he did change his mind, but there were other problems in the church that led him to make that decision in the first place, we would probably, uh, start looking for a new church as well, because, you know, it's, and it's not just about the vaccine. It's, it would be about any, uh, extra biblical requirement to come to church. You know, if they said you had to drive a red car in order to come to this church, or if you had to, um, you know, do anything really outside of scripture uh, as a requirement for coming to church. That just would not be right. You know, when, when I think about this and I, the, there are a couple of scriptures that always come to mind, you know, Jesus said, freely, you have received freely give, you know, there's not to be, there's not to be a barrier to the gospel or to the preaching of the word. Um, I think about when Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, you know, you people, you tie up heavy burdens and you lay them on people's shoulders and you don't lift a finger to help them. And that's what this is doing. This is tying up a heavy burden and laying it on people's shoulders as a requirement to enter the house of God. And that's very pharisaical. And that's that's the kind of thing uh, that the Pharisees were doing in Jesus' day. And he Jesus didn't seem to like that a whole lot. So... Yeah, that would that would be my answer as well. Um, you know, if 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 our pastor decided something like that and would not back down from it, we would be looking for a new church for sure. All right. Well, my next question is: it's a it's a, another scenario. Um, Michelle, you have been arrested for your Christian views, and you're going to lose your life if you don't deny Jesus. Now, okay, that's not my question. We already know that you're not going to do uh, deny Christ. But here's the real question: before your execution, you learn that you have under a minute to make a public statement that your family, friends, and everyone else will watch. You hardly have any time to prepare a speech, but in under sixty seconds. You're thinking on your feet. What are your last words? Oh, wow. That's a great question. I know. <laughs> well, if I were imprisoned and I was going to be executed, then I would have time to think about this and time it out just right. Um, no, this happened really yeah, fast. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd have a little longer to think about it than right now. Oh, but, yeah. So. Okay. You can think about um, it. <laughs> first, I w- first, I would like to say that I, you know, the, that kind of thought scares me to death. That is, that's what I'm scared of most in life. If I'm scared of anything is being, um, being tortured or being, you know, potentially executed for 
my faith or or even worse there are some some places on earth where they will say deny christ or we're going to hurt your children and oh, uh so wow. yeah. yeah i i pray that i am never in that kind of situation because i don't i don't trust myself you know i i'm i know how weak i am and so i hope i don't ever have to be in that kind of yeah. situation because i would not want to deny my lord but um okay so 30 or 60 seconds 60 seconds you're kind enough to give me 60 seconds okay so what i would say is um people listen up <laughs> you are all <laughs> sinners you know you're sinners don't try to deny it you have sinned against the holy god of the universe and you need to repent you need to turn away from your sin in your heart and and repent of it and admit that you're sinners and sorrowfully turn to christ in uh in repentance <laughs> and i'm not really eloquent in 60 seconds okay um so and you need to you need to repent and you if you want to escape the eternity that awaits you which is an eternity in hell you need to trust that Christ died for you on the cross, died for your sins to pay for that eternal penalty in hell so that you wouldn't have to pay it for yourself. And you need to trust his death, burial, and resurrection paid for that so that if you place your faith in him and in that as the payment for your sin, that you can stand clean and forgiven before God and you can meet me in heaven <laughs> where I'm fixing to go. <laughs> And, uh, and we'll rejoice together around the throne. But if you don't, God help you, because what's, what's happening to me right now is nothing compared to what's going to happen to you in your eternity. So my prayer would be that as, as I walk to these gallows or this guillotine or whatever it is, I'm praying for you that, that you would repent and place your faith in Christ. I, I would share the gospel. I hope I would do it better than I just did it just now. <laughs> That's amen amen yes i i love it i i would do the same my last words uh probably wouldn't be for the whole world just be, I, I know the whole world's watching but i would i would make it really personal for my family i think especially those who don't know jesus and then the rest of the world can can listen in but i would say something like you guys uh well you use guys <laughs> uh, my 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 beloved ones um i, I would just say i can't I can't deny Jesus Christ who has redeemed my life. So um, I'm surrendering my life here on this earth for a life with him forever. Um, I'd, I'd say something like in a few minutes, uh, I will be in his presence. And my final prayer is that you will be there with him too someday. Find out through the Bible who he is. He is God Almighty, your creator. Believe in him, trust him, and read his breathed out word. And then some kind of Love you. Goodbye. <laughs> kind of thing. But I mean, yes, share the gospel. Uh, and I hope that I would, uh, like you, Michelle, not be in that position. Um, you know, nobody wants to ever be in that position. And I, I hope that, you know, the, the Holy Spirit would give me those words in that in that moment and, and give me that strength, uh, which he promises he will do when we need him. So. All right. Last question for me. Is it the hard one you've been saving? Well, <laughs> they're both about equally challenging. We're not going to say they're hard, but they're, oh, they're challenging. Golly, okay. And I can't decide <laughs> which one to ask you. So I'm going to, I'm going to let you pick. Do you want number one or number five? Oh, uh, five. Number five. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know why either. I'll save the other one for another time. All right, here we go. You have a niece and a nephew who are five and seven years old. Their mother and their entire extended family are part of a quote-unquote Christian religion that is actually heretical. They teach salvation by works. The children's oh. mother, sadly, dies. And all the extended family members are assuring this ch these children that their mother is in heaven. What do you tell the children knowing that the mother believed a false gospel but not wanting to add to their grief? And let me just give you a few oh. seconds to think by, by saying this is th not a question that originated with me. I was actually asked this question uh, during a Q&A session at a conference not long ago. So that is hopefully a great you'll have question. a better answer than I did. <laughs> I, well, and I've got nieces and nephews too. And um, I, I've often thought 
what if I could, you know, how how much influence would I get to have? Do they live nearby? Could I take them in? Uh, could my yeah. husband and I um, be the ones to raise them? I don't know how that fits into that scenario, but um, I would want to have as much godly influence on those kids as I possibly could. And, uh, and with my own uh, niece now, we're trying to do that. We're trying to catechize as much as we possibly can uh, with them. And so I probably would avoid right now um, in because their minds are seven years old, five years old. You know, I, I probably wouldn't talk too much about that, but I would share with them the truth about who God is. You know, what, what is God like? What is heaven like? You know, and without saying, you know, your mom's there floating on a cloud with wings and all that stuff. Uh, I, I would just talk about what is God like and, and what does it mean for us to have a relationship with him? You know, how can we go to heaven? That kind of thing. And so, um, and I've got some really great, great books uh, from uh, a conference that I was at, at Answers in Genesis recently. And uh, they have some wonderful materials there. If you're ever at a conference there and you can get your hands on some of those Answers in Genesis books about, I mean, they're, they're pure theology and doctrine. They're, they're wonderful but they're at the right age level and I've got them. I'm, I'm at the ready and I'm ready to share. So, um, and that's what I have now. So I can, I can use some of those, that, that curriculum for that young age. And because it's been a long time since my kids have been that age. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, and I want them to be able to have a wonderful understanding of who God is. Um, I, I would want to see if I could, you know, have an overnight at Auntie Amy's house. Can we do yeah. that? And then <laughs> do it on a Saturday night because, and that's what we do. Actually, we, we time it on a Saturday night so that Sunday morning, oh, we're going to go to church and then we'll be over and, or you can come over for lunch and, and we take the kids to church and it's, it's wonderful. And then we have talks in the car. Uh, we talk about the songs we sing and, um, there's no children's church in our church. It's everybody together. It's a small church. So, um, so while well, they do have children's church up to second grade, but, uh, you know, ours is a, a curriculum where the kids third grade and up, they're there with the family. So, uh, we have some wonderful talks about that. And we talk, I would talk to them about pain and death and, and, you know, what we do with that pain is, is we give that to the Lord and, and we ask God to strengthen us through that. And we just give them as much love as possible. Um, and I think that if I'm in that situation, um, it would be a time to draw together as a family, but I would want to make sure that they get the correct, uh, understanding of who God is and not a heretical understanding. Right. And that's pretty much how I answered the question as well, um, yeah. except with the exception of possibly raising these children. I did, that didn't occur to me. But uh, what I said was that, um, you know, there's, there's, like Ecclesiastes says, there is a time for everything, every purpose under heaven. And I don't think you need to start you know, to go up to these children at their mother's funeral and tell them that she's in hell. Oh, you know, correct. there, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's a way to do these things. And we need, I know that all of us feel so, well, maybe I'm the only one who feels this way, but I, I think a lot of people probably feel that this is just so urgent when they hear something like this being said, at least when I hear something like this being said, that's false, especially to children who are so vulnerable. You just feel like, oh my goodness, I've got to say something right now, you know, and, and correct this. Um, but we need to, and I, I'm reminding myself of this while I'm saying it, we need to be able to trust God with you know, with the timing of when it's right to say something and when it, and when it's right to just keep your mouth shut. Um, and that's going to be a situational thing. I mean, I, I can't say, you know, in this particular situation, I would do this or give a blanket, you know, statement about everybody should do it this way. But well, I would, my answer was pretty much like yours. I would, as these children grow, um, share the gospel with them, take them to church, uh, maybe send them some books like you were talking about, um, and, and let them put it together, put two and two together on their own. And, and then it, especially since they'll be, you know, growing older in this whole process. And then if they come to you with the question, well, you told me this about the gospel does that mean my mom wasn't saved? Does that mean she's in hell? And I think at that point, it is, it's fair to answer their question, um, even with a general statement, like, 
the Bible says that people who do not believe this, this, and this uh, are going to spend an eternity in hell. And hopefully that wasn't the case with your mom. Hopefully she, at the last minute, was able to put her faith and trust in Christ and she's in heaven. Um, but the, the truth of, the, of what scripture says is that if she didn't, just like anybody else who doesn't, she is not in heaven right now. And I know that can be really painful to think about and that might break your heart. It makes me sad too, but um, we have to believe what scripture says. Now let's talk about you, you know, and, and shift the focus back to the child and sharing the gospel with the child. Um, and that's really, it's a difficult situation and it's very hard to think about having to do something like that, especially with a child. But I would, you know, the, if they falsely think their parent is in heaven, that doesn't really matter. That doesn't really, uh, determine whether they're going to heaven when they die or not. Correct. And so, so that, that's something, you know, if we have to let them believe that for a little while, while we're sharing the gospel with them and making sure they get, uh, making sure as far as we possibly can, that they get saved, um, that's not going to, I hate to say it's not going to hurt anything. We don't want to believe falsely about anything, but let me just say there, there's a hierarchy of priorities and the, the first priority is sharing the gospel with that child because it's too late to share the gospel with that mom. You have to focus yeah. on the child's um, situation and spiritual condition and everything. So I think that that would be my answer. And that that was um, when I was asked that question at a conference recently, that was pretty much my answer as well. So, yeah. And, and I would just add, too, as I as I'm thinking about this, God's judgment is always just he never makes an unfair right. judgment. His 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 laws and his judgment uh, and his mercy and his grace, all of it wrapped up together is, is perfect. God is perfect and he is good. He's very good. So, um, I, and so I would just remind uh, that young one about that. So. Right. Absolutely. Oh, well, ladies, we hope you enjoyed this What Will You Do episode of A Word Fitly Spoken. Let us know if you played along. Um, This was kind of challenging. Give us some feedback. Let us know if you'd like us to do this again sometime. You know, Michelle is saving that really super hard one. (laughs) Question number one, she's saving that for me. So just let us know if you want us to do that. And uh, don't forget to stop by A Word Fitly Spoken dot life to uh, check out all of our other resources. That's right. And until next time, what would you do? Get into the word and find out what you should do and walk worthy. 